see when you look in the mirror. Okay, I live and breathe microbiome science. So when I look in the mirror, this is what I see. I see an organism that is 43% human. I say that because it turns out most of our cells do not harbor our own DNA. They harbor the DNA of microbes. So you've got 39 trillion microbial cells and uh, 30 trillion human cells. Um, by the way, those, uh, those microbes include, obviously, bacteria, but also fungi, protozoa, um, bacteria-like cells called archaea, uh, and also viruses. So we've got 20,000 human genes. But look at the number of microbial genes we have. 2 to 20 million microbial genes. So just think, genetically speaking, we are only 1% human, okay? So where are all these cells located in our bodies? Exactly, everywhere. They are like, you know, every single nook and cranny of your body uh, has microbes, I mean, from head to toe, inside and out, we're covered in microbes. Um, but they are, are densest of all in the GI tract, throughout the GI tract, but most of all in the gut. So, um, in fact, I have a, um, a cool factoid that, that follows this. Uh, oh, by the way, most, not just the gut, oh, I can't go back. Can I go back? No, I can't. Oh, yes, I can go back. No, where am I? Here, this is where I want to be. The colon contains the highest microbial density recorded in any habitat on Earth with up to 10 to the 12 cells per gram of intestinal content. I think that's kind of cool. So. Uh, what are what are these uh, bacteria doing? Should we be concerned? Yeah, well, not at all, in my opinion. Uh, in fact, I would be more concerned, uh, you know, if we lost these great tenants, uh, because uh, these guys uh, give us superpowers. In in return for a share of every meal we consume, they synthesize vitamins, aid in digestion fortify our uh, immune systems, and um, actually by producing uh, certain chemicals, they, uh, they actually regulate uh, our emotions. So here's an example of their superpowers. Just a single species of bacteria, Bacteroides, Thetae, or Tau Micron. I practiced that several times. <laughs> contains an amazing arsenal of over 260 specific enzymes for breaking down different plant structures and 200 related genes. In contrast, we humans have a paltry uh, 33 enzymes for breaking down plant and, uh, sorry, breaking down basically um, fruits and vegetables, which you know, demonstrates just how dependent we have become on our resident microbes. Um, I mentioned that uh, that immune that um, that uh, the gut cells play a role in our um, immune defenses, and uh, that's really fortunate because uh, eating is an extremely risky, um, albeit necessary, activity. Because you know, after all, you are introducing potentially tainted substances into your body. That's what you're doing when you eat, right? So here's one of the ways our, uh, our gut bacteria help to um, protect us from pathogenic bacteria. They, uh, they basically crowd them out and uh, you know, they compete for the same food and space. So that's one way that they protect us, but they also 
produce toxins that take out aggressive bacteria. And what's more, um, see this um, thick layer of green? That is mucus. And mucus um, coats the entire uh, gut wall. Those purple cells are the gut wall. And, um, and it, it, uh, it, part of why it's so protective is because it's densely populated with a veritable army of um, trillions upon trillions of viruses. And these are phages, bacterial phages. So these viruses will only take out aggressive bacteria that don't stay where they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be up here, okay, sort of in this central food chute, right? But if they, if they uh, start to penetrate the, the mucus layer, uh, that's when the viruses uh, will take them out, right? So basically, from this perspective, um, you know, the, our uh, gut microbes serve as our first defense against infection. And our own uh, immune cells uh, only uh, jump into action if the first line of defense fails. So there are, our immune cells are, in truth, backup reinforcement. So make no, no mistake, our first line of defense against disease is our microbes. So needless to say, this is a very different perspective on disease than uh, what we're typically taught in school, right? I, I love these quotes. I mean, so this is the first quote. We used to think that the immune, the, sorry, we used to think that the immune system evolved to kill microbes. Now it's looking like microbes help run the immune system. Uh, that, that was uh, a quote from David Montgomery and Anne B. Clay, uh, two biologists at the University of Washington. And here's a, a quote from uh, a terrific uh, science journalist named Ed Young. Viruses can be allies. Immune systems can support microbes. So I now want to talk about how we get our microbiota, how we acquire it. And uh, just, I don't know, five or six years ago when I was first teaching a, a course on this topic at the University of Miami, there was a big uh, debate in science about uh, whether we acquired uh, our microbiota in the womb. And uh, some scientists argued, and, and they did have some evidence to show that uh, microbes from mom can actually cross the placenta and uh, get into the fetus. And so, um, you know, there, there was this, this big debate that went on, but the evidence is now pretty settled. I mean, there's, there may be a few outliers, but I think there's pretty broad consensus now that this is the way we get our microbiota at birth, okay? So occasionally, uh, they, bacteria will cross the placenta, but it's mainly in uh, unhealthy pregnancies when that happens. So uh, when, uh, basically, um, the womb is, as best we can tell, one of the most sterile habita habitats, at least natural habitats on Earth, okay? But the moment the amniotic sac breaks, wave upon wave of bacteria jump aboard the baby. And as the baby is like exiting the vagina, it's exposed to mom's fecal bacteria. And when the baby's placed on her chest, it's exposed to mom's um, skin bacteria. Uh, but babies also get their microbiota from many other sources. So for example, the, the, from the doctors and nurses that help deliver them from their first swaddling uh, blanket, their first pacifier, from siblings, and uh, on and on uh, throughout uh, the first um, few years of life. In fact, it's really not until about, uh, uh, during the first few years of life, the microbiome is very uh, dynamic and can change dramatically almost from day to day. Uh, but it, around three years of life, especially when you start introducing solid uh, foods, 
um, the baby's uh, microbiome starts to look, sort of assume a more um, adult-like configuration. So these are uh, the main phyla that are found in, in the gut. So, you know, there's thousands and thousands of different types of firmicutes, bacteroidetes, and actinobacteria. Uh, and, and each of us has uh, a unique composition of uh, microbiota. So, for example, maybe 40% of my uh, gut bacteria are, are firmicutes. But uh, maybe you have 60% firmicutes. Or, you know, so you can inherit not only, you know, different species of bacteria, but in very uh, different proportions. So your gut microbiome is uh, as unique as a fingerprint. There are no two people with exactly uh, the same gut microbiota. So if you think about it that way, uh, what I'm going to tell you next shouldn't surprise you, which is the very same food can be uh, healthful or harmful depending on the individual. So something that's good for me might be bad for you. And I can say this because of this uh, landmark study that was done uh, in Israel. I think it was back in uh, 2018. And what the uh, scientists did is they hooked about 800 people um, up to uh, a continuous, uh, a portable uh, glucose monitor. So they were continuously uh, monitoring um, how much glucose they produced when they then introduced individual food items. And um, generally speaking, um, uh, you've heard of the term glycemic index. Foods that cause like really big spikes in glucose after you um, eat them are, are th usually thought of as unhealthy, okay? And um, what the researchers found is that, you know, if for any single food item, if they averaged how all 800 people responded and they calculated the glycemic index, it exactly matched what was printed in medical tables. But when they looked at how, not the, the average, but how each individual responded, they got very, very different responses. So for example, for some people, um, it turns out that ice cream is a better choice of food than white rice, okay? <laughs> Everybody's saying, oh, ice cream is good for me. <laughs> They'll have to test you with a glucose monitor. <laughs> um, and uh, there was even a case of uh, one man who was in the study. Um, it, it turned out that a food that was for the vast majority of um, study participants very helpful, um, tomatoes. Well, for tomatoes were bad for him. They were causing a huge uh, uh, spike in his glucose. And when he then... Um, removed tomatoes from his diet, he was able to control his glucose in a way that had previously uh, been impossible. And the Israeli researchers found that the reason why people had such disparate responses to the same food items was because of their gut microbiota. So that was the key determinant. So microbiome science, uh, you know, has taught us that our body, in essence, is an ecosystem. And uh, as, as I'm sure any of you who have studied ecology know, um, a uh, rich, diverse ecosystem is usually a healthy ecosystem, and one that lacks diversity and has fewer species, fewer species diversity, uh, is, is usually what, what we call a sick uh, ecosystem or a, an ecosystem in disarray. And so like uh, on the left, you have a coral reef that's thriving. You can see all those you know, different uh, creatures that are living on the reef. And on the right, 
you're actually seeing a, a, a system that's thriving, but it doesn't have that many different types of, of uh, life forms. It's a primarily dominated by fleshy algae. And so that's an unhealthy system. You can have a lot of uh, you know, organisms living in an unhealthy system, but they're out of whack, they're out of balance, okay? And it seems that something similar is uh, what happens, uh, it's the same thing holds true uh, for humans. And uh, one thing that is very concerning is that there is mounting evidence that our uh, modern lifestyles are basically eroding our microbiota. We're driving more and more uh, species extinct. So I'm just gonna talk about a few of the reasons. Um, oh, before I do, there was a study uh, published just this week. I mean, I think it came out like, like five days ago in Cell Magazine, Cell Journal. And uh, what the um, investigators, uh, they're from uh, Stanford University, the Sonnenbergs, husband and wife team, um, w what they uh, found was, uh, what they went and they, they uh, sequenced the um, microbiomes of one of the uh, few um, groups of people on Earth that still enjoy a kind of hunter-gatherer lifestyle. They're, you know, basically foragers, the Hazda, uh, who live in Africa. So they sequenced their genes, and then they compared the um, number of species in their guts to that of um, Californians, so people living, you know, in a, in, a, in a modern industrial society. And this is what they found. Um, so... The average Californian has 277 gut species, uh, species of bacteria in their gut, whereas the average Hazda had 730 different uh, species of gut bacteria. And th the investigators are also found that there were 1,125 uh, microbiome species new to science um, that were found in the samples from the Hazda. And here's a quote that um, I uh, extracted from the paper. Um, the, the, the researchers say, there has been extensive perturbation of the gut microbiome induced by the industrialized lifestyle. So that's basically the takeaway. So it looks like there's a whole bunch of things uh, that are eroding our microbiome. Um, and it's hard to say how much any one factor you know, uh, plays a role. But here's clearly one of them, and that is diet. So most of us know we should be eating this colorful diet, right? But how many of you are eating this colorful diet? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, I hate to admit it, but I eat more of that than I should, too. It's irresistible, and it's processed food. And, you know, all the nutrients are stripped out of it. And um, you're kind of basically cheating your microbiota when you eat this kind of diet. They, they kind of, a lot of them sort of starve and uh, go extinct. And only a few, what I call weed species, you know, kind of survive and take over. So that's clearly having an impact. We also know that the um, rampant and indiscriminate use of antibiotics um, has, um, you know, driven a lot of uh, gut species to extinction. Um, and, you know, not just uh, in medicine, you know, how, how many of us will take an antibiotic at the first sniffle not knowing whether we have a bacterial infection that, that would uh, actually respond to antibiotics or a viral infection? Or even if we do have a bacterial infection, you know, maybe we should just wait a few days and see if it doesn't go away on its own, right? So we're really quick to swallow pills. And then, uh, as a lot of you, I'm sure, know, um, the agricultural industry, uh, you know, really uses antibiotics, um, uh, you know, to, to uh, I in agriculture, you know, to we give them to uh, cattle uh, for a variety of reasons. 
So that's having a bad effect on our microbiome. Um, and it, well, let me just see how much time I have. Buffer. Yeah, I think I'll skip this next slide. So, whoops. Um, hmm, that's weird. Okay, yes. Ah, okay. Um, something else affecting our microbiome. I told you that we acquire our microbiota, uh, microbiota at birth. How many of you were delivered by C-section? A lot of us, right? <laughs> a lot, a lot. I'm actually surprised. I'm surprised so few. I'm surprised so few hands actually went up because, like in my when I teach this course at the University of Miami, uh, actually a larger proportion of hands go up. But if you look at this um, graph, you'll see this uh, this graph goes from 1997 to the year 2000. And as it turns out, I gave birth in 1997 to my last child, and uh, at that time. 20% or 21% of births in the United States were by C-section. Today, it's closer to 33%. So that's a big jump. And um, if you're delivered by C-section, you, um, um, you, ha you often have a different microbiome. Uh, on you'll have fewer of your mom's uh, bacteria. Um, and uh, we can t talk more about the about this afterwards, if you like, but um, it it um, ha does uh, alter your microbiome and can have uh, long-term health effects. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're germophobic, right? I mean, COVID didn't help matters, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> microbes have really uh, gotten a bad rap. Um, to lots of people, the word uh, bacteria is synonymous with germ. And so we basically, you know, zap every surface in sight. And I mean, you know, if you, if you just walk down the aisle of a grocery store down and look down the, um, you know, cleaning agent's aisle, you'll see that every other product boasts, you know, germicidal, kills germs, uh, disinfectant. <laughs> yeah, there you go, there you go. So we're, you know, I, I think uh, maybe it's time to rethink uh, our, our, our stance towards our, our microbiome because just think the vast, vast majority of um, microbes um, that live in us and on us and around us uh, are either harmless or beneficial. In fact, uh, a lot are, you know, really essential for uh, good health. And something else you might not think of, but uh, our livelihoods affects our microbiome. So if you go back a century, century and a half, most people were farmers. That was a major means of livelihood. And people who farm the land, um, they, um, they get exposed to a lot of soil bacteria. Uh, also, if they, if they raise um, cattle and other animals, they're exposed to a lot of um, animal microbes. And uh, this exposure to uh, microbes um, has a very positive effect, at least in terms of in increasing um, diversity of your microbiome. Like I, I, remember, I, I mentioned earlier the study of the HASDA, and you can see the average Californian has 207 uh, species of bacteria in their gut. Uh, and people who have a farming lifestyle, they look to both Californians and people from Nepal who had a farming lifestyle. And they were kind of intermediate in the number of uh, species they ha had in their guts, as you can see. Those people had about 433 species of bacteria um, in comparison to the 730 that the HASDA have and the 277 that probably most of the people in this room would have around that number of bacteria. Um, have any of you heard of the hygiene hypothesis? No, okay. I thought maybe, oh, you, so you have. 
And um, what it is, is um, it's, it is a theory, and when it was first proposed, it was very controversial. And now um, I think uh, that there it's really gained strong support. It is a theory, but um, there's, l I think, a lot of evidence now that support it, and that is that if you grow up in too clean an, env an environment, that um, you're depriving um, your body, well, ba basically your immune system early in life, like uh, during the formative years, needs to, or are ideally should be exposed to lots and lots of different kinds of bacteria because that helps train the immune system. It sort of turns the, our immune system into kind of you know, a sharpshooter. But if you don't get enough exposure because you, know, you have a, a desk job, you're not toiling in the fields, uh, you don't have many pets, so you're not exposed to many animals, um, you've taken a lot of antibiotics, you know, all the things, you eat, eat a bad, you know, highly processed diet. Uh, if you don't get exposed to a lot of microbes, then your immune system has more difficulty uh, telling friend from foe. And um, you've probably heard of um, autoimmune disorders. Uh, here's an example. On the right, you'll see quite a few. Crohn's disease, which is a type of inflammatory um, bowel disease. Um, I, don't, I should put my glasses on so I can better read this. Okay, multiple sclerosis, type 1 diabetes, asthma. All of these are um, what are known as autoimmune disorders. And they've, um, for reasons that, you know, initially really um, mystified a lot of doctors, um, starting, you know, especially like in the late 20th century and, um, and then into the 21st century, uh, you're starting to see big increases in uh, autoimmune conditions. And uh, the hygiene hypothesis is uh, one leading theory uh, as to why this is happening. Because with an autoimmune condition, your body um, is mistaking your own tissues for that of a foreign invader. And for that reason, your immune system turns against you and attacks your own body. And so, you know, like if MS, it's attacking the um, myelin sheath that coats neural circuits in your brain. Uh, you know, type 1 diabetes, it's attacking the cells uh, in your pancreas that produce insulin. Uh, so this is... Uh, as I say, a theory, but it has a lot of evidence um, that, that um, the erosion of our microbiome uh, could be contributing to these um, disorders as well as um, many other uh, chronic diseases. So it's kind of ironic because if you look uh, on the left side, you'll see um, those were the leading diseases earlier in the 20th century. And they're all infectious diseases, right? And you know, it's a great medical success story, really, that those diseases have all, you know, in part due to antibiotics and vaccines, they have greatly declined. But at the same time, you're seeing a, bi a big rise in um, these autoimmune disorders. I want to now introduce you to um, a workhorse of microbiome science, and that is the bubble mouse. The, the bubble mouse uh, is a creature that does not exist in nature. It's um, raised in completely sterile facilities, and consequently, it has no microbiome. And um, uh, we've gained big insights into a number of um, diseases, the role of the microbiome in a number of diseases by uh, carrying out this kind of study. Let me show you. 
So uh, one group of researchers found um, rare groups of uh, rare um, uh, identical twins who were discordant for um, body weight. So they, they searched far and wide and they found some twins where one was overweight and the other, whoops, I don't know what caused that, but yeah, here we go. And what they did is they, um, nope, I went back, it keeps moving. So uh, they took uh, gut bacteria from the overweight twin, transferred it to bubble mice, and the rodents got fat. Then they took gut bacteria from the thin twin, transferred it to uh, bubble mice, and the rodents didn't gain weight. They stayed the same size. So this shows, among other things, that, you know, something I've alluded to before, uh, that your gut microbiota do have a big uh, impact on your body weight. And uh, w some of this is due to how you know, the microbiota actually harvests calories from food. Uh, but also, um, your gut microbiota uh, influences your appetite. So uh, I, I now want to talk more about um, the role of gut bacteria in not just um, what well, we talked about appetite, but also how our gut microbiota affects uh, mood and, um, and cognition. So here we go. Um, the first thing you need to know is that uh, gut bacteria produce, I don't know why this keeps jumping around. Um, gut bacteria produce um, hordes of psychoactive compounds. In fact, um, every single neurotransmitter and hormone found in the brain is synthesized by one or another species of bacteria in your gut. Um, so with that in mind, let me tell you about this study. It's kind of similar to the obesity study. They took gut bacteria from a depressed person, transferred it to a bubble mouse, and the animal displayed depressive symptoms, for example, when placed in a tank of water, um, it gave up swimming. It gave up trying to escape sooner than, I don't know why it keeps jumping around. Any ideas? Uh, it gave up swimming sooner than um, a mouse, a, a bubble mouse that received gut bacteria from a non-depressed person. That mouse um, continued to swim um, it, it, it struggled longer to try to escape. It was not so quick to give in to despair. And uh, one of the ways that we know that gut bacteria uh, influence cognition um, is simply by comparing the behavior of a normal mouse with a bubble mouse. And we know, for example, that you know a normal mouse um, is a quick and eager learner. You show it uh, a, a novel object like a napkin ring and it will circle and sniff it with great interest. You place it in a maze and it's keen to explore new passages and it remembers where it's been. But a bubble mouse could not be more different. It's slow to learn, quick to forget. Um, it, uh, it lacks natural curiosity, uh, and not only that, um, they are, are stunningly devoid of fear. So for example, if you separate um, you know, a tiny uh, mouse pup from its mom, a bubble mouse, um, it won't even protest, whereas uh, you know, a normal mouse uh, it you know, would, uh, it would it could, could lead to lifelong skittishness 
It would be a major trauma for a normal mouse, but bubble mice, you know, well, goodbye, mom. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> you know, despite the fact that they rely on them for, you know, nourishment and protection and everything else. So they're really weird creatures. Uh, I'm now going to talk a little bit more about the gut-brain access because I think this is one of the most fascinating areas of microbiome uh, science myself. And um, I said that, that gut bacteria produce all these... Um, it's so weird. I'm seeing different things than what's here. But that's the slide I want you to see, so... Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, th they, they produce psychoactive compounds. Well, you know, obviously one of the ways those psychoactive compounds get to the brain is via the circulatory system. But another way they get to the brain is um, basically, um, let me get this star, I jumped ahead. Uh, another way they get to the brain is uh, the psychoactive compounds um, either the bacteria themselves or the psychoactive compounds they make um, act on a nerve that, that leads directly from the gut to the brain. That nerve is called um, the, vaca the vagus nerve. So it's like a direct line of communication between the gut and the brain. And um, it turns out that 80% of the traffic on the vagus nerve is going from the gut to the brain and not the other way around as uh, scientists had long assumed. And finally, another way that gut bacteria uh, can uh, impact the brain is by misbehaving. So if uh, gut bacteria, if aggressive bacteria actually um, not just reach the gut wall but breach it, um, then uh, our immune cells will rush to the scene and surprising scientists, those immune cells do not always stay localized in the gut, but can actually um, travel, the, the immune cells and associated compounds will travel to the brain where they cause inflammation. And for reasons that are not very well understood, inflammation and depression often go hand in hand. They are a destructive duo. Um, people who are contemplating suicide tend to have highly inflamed brains. So um, I've given you a brief whirlwind tour of uh, all these different ways that, um, that our microbiome affects our health. So I now want to uh, switch to talking a little bit about um, treatments. Now, there are, as I speak, microbiome-based treatments uh, under development for no end of different types of disorders from diabetes and heart, heart disease to osteoporosis. Uh, the list goes on and on. But I, I want to, um, because I don't have all the time in the world, I'm just going to f uh, focus now on uh, neuropsychiatric disorders. So one way that microbiome researchers are, are trying to treat mental disturbances is by changing the composition of our gut microbiota. Um, and another way is they're trying to boost or block the action of the chemicals that these um, microbes produce. And to that end, they're making uh, exciting progress in pinpointing exactly which bacteria are good or bad actors in uh, various uh, neuropsychiatric conditions. Sorry, kind of a <laughs> cartoon of good and bad bacteria. So um, uh, in, in the case of uh, autism spectrum disorder, scientists have um, discovered that uh, many youngsters with the condition uh, have elevated levels of a bacterial protein uh, in their blood, and in rodents, this protein has been shown to elevate anxiety and uh, alter brain connectivity. So a company that's at the forefront of developing microbiome-based therapies um, is, has launched a clinical trial to uh, test a drug designed to block this destructive 
compound from reaching the brain. The goal is to treat uh, irritability in uh, autistic children. Um, similarly, uh, in Italy, uh, a group of researchers have um, discovered a um, bacterium in yogurt called Lactobacillus roideri uh, that uh, has been shown to boost sociability in animal models of autism. And they are now um, giving this bacterium to aut autistic children to see if it might uh, boost their sociability as well. Um, both good and bad bacteria have been linked to um, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. That is the uh, neurodegenerative disease that uh, paralyzed the great uh, American baseball player Lou Gehrig at the very peak of his career. And like Lou Gehrig, most people who have the disease die within just a few years of diagnosis. A small minority will live as 10 years, 15. I actually know somebody who's lived 20 years. Uh, they're kind of off the charts. Uh, and interestingly, in uh, uh, Israel, a group of researchers recently discovered uh, two um, bacteria uh, in the gut that seem to accelerate the disease, and another bacterium that uh, prolongs survival. And um, they've traced the benefits of the good bacterium to its production of the vitamin nictinamide. So they have launched a clinical trial where they're giving this vitamin to people with ALS to see if it will prolong their survival as well. I'll be taking questions afterwards, so hold on to that thought. <laughs> um, uh, microbiome researchers are making even greater progress in unraveling the root causes of Parkinson's disease, uh, that, which is the second most common uh, neurological disease after Alzheimer's, by the way. Uh, you may know um, Michael J. Fox. I don't know if you've seen him in any films. What's that? Back to the Future, yes. Okay, um, and uh, yeah, he was a child star, and he, uh, he kind of ha has put a human face on Parkinson's. He got it at a very uh, an unusually um, young age. And if you've seen any recent videos of him, you'll know the hallmark symptoms of Parkinson's are um, shaking, stiffness, and um, kind of mal-coordination, um, difficulty walking, if you will. And it, it's long been known that um, Parkinson's disease involves the misfolding um, of a protein called alpha-synuclein in uh, this part of the brain. Can you see my pointer? Sort of. And um, as the misfolding uh, proceeds, as it spreads, then you get worsening of symptoms. So uh, the big mystery, of course, is you know, what causes alpha-synuclein, the Parkinson's protein, to misfold in the first place. And uh, several labs have recently converged on one likely culprit, and that is uh, some people contain a bacterium in their gut a type of E. coli that produces a um, misfolded protein very similar to the Parkinson's protein. And when they inject this um, misfolded protein into the uh, guts of susceptible rodents, um, it causes uh, nor n the normal protein found in the gut lining to misfold in turn and uh, kind of like, uh, you know, dominoes, uh, a, a, a chain reaction of dominoes falling over, the, um, what happens is the misfolding protein, um, then it spreads up the vagus nerve to the brain, and in about two months, you start to see clumped up protein in exactly the part of the brain that uh, uh, degenerates in Parkinson's patients. It's now estimated that um, about 30% to 50% 30 of cases of Parkinson's disease uh, actually uh, start in the gut. If so, that would explain why most patients with Parkinson's disease uh, suffer, suffer from terrible constipation 
uh, many years, often decades, before they display any neurological um, symptoms. And um, also, it's interesting, we've known for some time that if um, you cut the vagus nerve, as uh, was once done for uh, uh, to treat uh, difficult to heal, to heal ulcers, you reduce the risk of developing Parkinson's disease by 40%. So we, we don't, you know, it, it's early days yet. Um, and as I say, scientists are developing microbiome-based treatments for no end of different diseases, not just ones that um, affect the brain. Um, and um, with varying degrees of success, I mean, there, uh, the best success story so far is, have any of you guys heard of uh, Clostridium difficile, C. diff? Okay, so it causes, um, it's a terrible infection, and um, people can get it in ho the hospital. That's the most common way. And of course, the elderly tend to be in the hospital most of all, and um, for, for older people, it can even um, be lethal. And it basically, the, it, it's a, a gut uh, a, a pathogen that it causes just a chronic diarrhea, uh, and it it's no longer responds to most antibiotics. And so, I mean, people are kind of like chained to a toilet, and the elderly often die because, uh, you know, they just can't, um, you know, it's, it, they're, they're too fra fragile. Um, and when, um, uh, and it was actually people, I don't know how this came about, I don't know the details, but news got out that uh, the gut, uh, that, that if you got gut bacteria from a healthy person, and people are actually using like turkey basters. They get gut, you know, stool from a, a healthy relative and inject it <laughs> up their anus. And it's called fecal micro microbial transfer. Anyway, it cured them. It cured them. And of of Clostridium dif difficile. And it's called it's called fecal microbial transplantation. And um, there. Researchers, you'll be happy to hear that they have now, um, uh, they've found a more aesthetic way of doing this, and that's called poop pills, or <laughs> also known as crapsules. Um, but basically, they take uh, gut bacteria from healthy donors, purify it, just the bacteria, that is, and then uh, they, and they've uh, treat the capsule in a special way so that it won't be broken down until it reaches the large intestine. So they're using this approach uh, to try and treat uh, a number of different um, disorders. And they have had some success actually with um, inflammatory bowel disease, diseases like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Not as, as um, it's not been as successful as um, using FMT, that's the term for fecal micro microbial transfer. Not as, success, as successful as for C. diff, but still, you know, it, it's uh, pretty effective in bringing about remission, but people have to keep retaking the poop pills. <laughs> uh, whereas with C. diff, you know, a single microbial transfer and they're cured. That's it, it's like, it's really, truly like a miracle for, for people who have intractable um, C. diff. But uh, it's really interesting what's going on in the field. For example, I was just reading that in Australia, um, there are two individuals who are, you know, like everybody else in the world, they're on the net, uh, internet, reading everything they can, and they got it in their heads that if they uh, got FMT, that um, these two individuals both um, suffered from bipolar disorder, manic depression. And um, they got in their heads that if they got, you know, FMT, that maybe it would cure them. And I have never seen any study to test this idea. So these are probably one-offs for all we know, but um, the first person who tried it in Australia um, succeeded in curing themselves. They got the uh, microbial sample from their husband. The woman was in her early 30s and had well-documented bipolar disorder. I mean, she'd 
been hospitalized a few times. She'd been taking all kinds of psychiatric drugs for years and years and years. I mean, since 13 or 14 years of age, very, very well documented. And it's also very well documented. I think it's now five or six years out since she got her microbe transplant, and she's been fine. Now, as I say, that could be just a one-off. I don't, I really don't know what to make of it, but what I can tell you is when she talked about her success story, then somebody else in Australia also decided to try it, and it worked for him too. <laughs> I have not seen any other studies, and um, you know, w we don't know because one of the tricky things with um, FMT is that because each of us has a totally unique microbiome, the kind of microbiome that's going to restore our microbiome to health can also vary. So, you know, maybe, you know, let's just say I had inflammatory bowel disease. Maybe my husband's microbiome would cure me, you know, because he's healthy, right? But maybe it wouldn't, you know? And so one of the really hard things that microbiome researchers are struggling with is how to figure out, you know, how do you define a healthy microbiome for each individual? And so uh, something else that um, a lot of people are doing, I haven't done it yet, I keep saying I'm gonna do it and I haven't quite gotten around to it, but there's something called the um, uh, American Gut Project, and I'll see if I can find the link to it, but basically, you know, you can, uh, you know, send off a stool sample, or from that matter, you know, swab your belly button or your ear or what, any part of your body and get, you know, your microbiome sequenced. And let's just say, okay, right now you're, you're totally healthy, but let's just say in five years, uh, you know, you develop um, inflammatory bowel disease or MS or whatever, uh, Parkinson's disease. And then we could go back, and if, if you had your microbiome sequenced, we would then know this is a healthy microbiome for this person. And so let's see if we can reconstitute this. Because if you try and um, reconstitute somebody's microbiome with another healthy mi microbiome, but it isn't as a, a very good match with what your original healthy microbiome looked like, it's, it's hard to get the colonizers to stay, you know, and really take root, if you will, to stay in the gut. Otherwise, a lot of times you just kind of flush out the, the newcomers because the, the founding population, you know, has a big advantage. You know, it's like, imagine you're, mo you know, you're a forager from way back when and you go to new territory and you see, you know, you want to go find a, a cave for shelter. Well, it's a good idea not to pick an occupied cave, right? <laughs> Better to pick one that's empty. But, you know, if, you, if it's occupied, uh, you know, and your gut microbes, occupy the brain, the first ones to colonize our, not, not the brain, the gut, at the first ones to colonize the body, and so it's hard to evict them and replace them with a different microbiome. Anyway, uh, I just wanna leave you with a few um, parting thoughts, and, um, and that is, you're, you're no doubt familiar with these um, maps of yore that are missing entire continents, right? Well, you know, to me, you know, it, not very long ago, like just 20 years ago, just think, I mean, our understanding of the human body or of it was so primitive. I mean, we were kind of like missing the equivalent of, of continents. You know, we did, we, we overlooked the, that more than half of our cells aren't, don't even have our own DNA. Or, you know, that microbial speaking, you know, we're 99%, we're you know, um, our genes are 99% microbial. I mean, how do you do systems biology when, <laughs> you know, you're overlooking continents? So, you know, it, it's a br brand new field. I, honestly, it's one of the most I exciting uh, or hottest fields uh, in modern medicine. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I can't say, you know, which of the many um, types of treatments, microbiome-based treatments under development are gonna pan out. But uh, I hope I've convinced you that um, 
this field has uh, is is trans transformational. Uh, I, I really think we can expect um, very exciting, innovative uh, approaches to um, treating many diseases uh, coming out of this field in, in, in the future years and decades ahead. Well, thank you very much, and I'm very happy to take Um, I'm going to just uh, call on the gentleman in the back there with the blue shirt. Yeah, you. Because, yeah, you were the first to raise your hand, so that's why I'm calling on you. Oh, okay.